Okay. So first of all, thank you all for being here. I'm very sorry about the slight delay due to traffic um, in Cape Town. A uh, big thank you to the colleagues online also um, for joining us and for the colleagues here. Uh, we wanted to kick off this week of <laughs> events of the conference with a side event that actually um, looks at one of the tools that we had developed over the, the years, which is foundational for us, because it's also something that allowed us to look deeper into the different dimensions of inequalities. To, to launch uh, partnerships, both with different research uh, universities, but also with uh, national statistical offices uh, and governments. Um, and also to build on what has been done and look a little bit into the future and what could the future inequality diagnostics look like? What are the interesting dimensions that we could include? Um, and also try to look with our colleagues from the ILO, whom I thank again for having joined the conference and, and the side event, um, on what would a future inequality diagnostic that also looks at labor market adjustments look like? Um, and how can we, we all join forces around this in the future? So without further ado, because we're a little bit late, I will just uh, pass the floor to Marie uh, for the first part of the session. Good morning, uh, everybody, and those online too. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm Murray Labrant. I'm the uh, director of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research. Uh, Right, thank you. Uh, based at the University of Cape Town and uh, it's wonderful to be here with our partners in the session. Uh, and my, uh, my job really is to spend a few minutes only um, talking about the diagnostic and uh, in particular from uh, Arua's point of view, uh, just to introduce it, so, to bring us up to speed and then uh, uh, then we'll take it from there in terms of the morning. So I'm speaking especially from the role of the diagnostic in uh, the, the work of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research, which is one of the uh, African Research Universities Alliance Centers of Excellence. So the Arua is a group of uh, now about 15 of the countries, uh, of the continent's top research universities that has a mission really to, to, to make sure that, that uh, tackling Africa's key issues is grounded in uh, African, in Africa, and in uh, research bases that uh, can actually um, do the job as well. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the diagnostics, so, so uh, ASA, as uh, as the Center on Poverty and Inequality uh, of the uh, African Research Universities Alliance um, received foundational support from the AFD in setting up and going. And it was really, uh, well, I think it was the genius, but maybe, you know, uh, uh, of under actually, of this idea of a diagnostic as a tool that gave you, that prepared a platform for, and a partnership. I think that's, those are the two th key things I want to stress from, from Arua's point of view. A platform and a partnership to actually play your role as a constructive um, uh, aid, agent, as a partnership into, into uh, profiling inequality in different country contexts and giving, giving um, sensitivity to the country context but also building the partnership to, to carry forward then a dialogue into better policy making and, uh, uh, and building the evidence base. So, so that was my first key point, that it's a platform for partnership. And what is it? Well, for us, the, the, the diagnostics in each of our country contexts, 
it was a partnership with with the national statistical offices. And so we have Verna here today from Stats and we, we've enjoyed a wonderful working relationship with Verna, with AFD, and also with the policy community, because the research community in South Africa does, in Africa generally, does enjoy a close working relationships with the NSOs and close working relationships with their policy community. But you've still got to put something in place to, to, to make that work if the focus is going to be around strategies to overcome inequality. Um, and so we have three key partners in, in Asia and one in South Africa, one in Ghana, and one in Kenya. And in each of those country contexts, we... Uh, we set about this diagnostic process with the national statistical offices where we try to, um, it's a framework to integrate the data that the country has available to analyze these issues uh, in quite a sophisticated way. Make sure you're tackling the dimensions of inequality that are important in any African context. Uh, interrogate the data, put it together, consolidate it, look at it, look at it hard, express its flaws, its limitations, what's it capable of, what's it not capable of. It's hard work, but it's done in a partnership. And like the NSOs are often the, the, the site of the SDG reporting too. So there's this close connection to the SDG reporting uh, offices. Uh, I'll leave Werner to talk on behalf of how that, that works from their point of view. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Uh, but I'm just trying to to express this sort of close working relationship that gets that doesn't uh, put aside the hard work of actually marshalling the data, but also then um, uh, producing these reports that are then a profile. Okay, here's what the inequality situation looks like in the country, uh, having marshalled the data. Um, and what is that then? That's a platform for... For, for, for the national discussion, like national uh, planning uh, commissions, for example, find this diagnostic extremely interesting. Uh, for those online, uh, people in the audience are getting so excited by the story of mine, they're, they're, fl <laughs> they're flinging stuff around. Uh, and so that's rather glorious. Uh, we are also excited. And these diagnostics have, been, have, have done that. They've energized the national discussion but also uh, pushed into the policy space. Uh, so we produced uh, three uh, diagnostics together with our partners um, and uh, also in consultation with uh, the, the, uh, the policy people from the outset. You've got to set this thing up right, but then you've got to do the job and produce the diagnostics. And once that's done, then you can... Uh, in each of the country contexts, we had uh, engagements around the diagnostics. Uh, so, But we had something to talk about. We'd achieved what we wanted to achieve in some sense at that stage. Um, and, uh, and the link then to the, the EU and the inequality facility uh, all the way along is also crucial. This isn't an attempt to assert, okay, now Africans must only talk about Africa's problems. We're trying to put a base in place, uh, 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 and uh, and our view is actually that that the African context has a lot to contribute into the broader international discussion about how to overcome inequalities and the reassertion of of many complicated dimensions of inequality in the so-called global north recently. Uh, that's left left us like an emperor without any clothes. We don't actually have the capacity to tackle some of these issues that we've been trying to tackle in an African context anyway. Uh, so, um, so that diagnostic process was a, a fantastic launch pad for, for ASA to, to do its work well integrated, to have an impact on policy. Uh, uh, I think hopefully within the EU facility, the diagnostics were recognized as, as, as as a really good idea, not just for ASA. Right? I'm to, I've spoken quite self directly to the African uh, diagnostics today, but um, there's been a, a demand to do them elsewhere. Right, exactly. We have uh, we have people who've come all the way from Indonesia to be with us today, and uh, thank you so much. And they will be talking 
as well about their diagnostics. And um, Marley, uh, we, we've been working on a diagnostic that's been an, also an amazing uh, process of this consolidation. Uh, but with obviously the political climate is quite difficult. And there's more that are planned. Uh, maybe Ander can talk about those if, uh, if she wants to. My, my closing point really, which then leads into the day is, so it, it, it's a brilliant idea. And it was a huge success, but it's a start, not an end. And so what we're doing today really is to take stock and say, okay, but how do you push on? It needs to push on in the same process that ran the diagnostics all the way along. It's a partnership. And uh, uh, and so the, ASA, of course, is incredibly committed to that. And, and we, we've continued with our work. This was a wonderful platform for us. It gave us something credible to offer into the space. But now we're pushing on, and I think today is a wonderful way to do that. Thank you. Okay. Now, we'll do Werner. There we go. To, to just men, to take us through the first diagnostic that we had done, uh, which was the South African one. Uh, thank you very much, Anda and Murray. Um, I think they've uh, undersold the value that Acer brought to this process. Um, but let me begin. My name is Vanna Ruch. I'm the Director for Money Metric Poverty and Inequality Statistics at StatsSA. And I'm also currently the Project Director for the Income and Expenditure Survey 2022-2023, which we have in the field and will be completing data collection actually in the next uh 20, 25 days. So it's an exciting time, very stressful. It's been a, a wild ride to get here. But just to, to maybe dive in a bit to the, the inequality trends, I think if we think back to the South African context, uh, inequality is one of the two core uh, objectives of uh, the country's national development plan. So in, in, in 2010, 2009, that point, they had set up the National Planning Commission with the goal of setting out a 30-year sort of vision for where South Africa needs to be. Now, we all know the, the, the triple challenges, poverty, inequality, and unemployment, but the NDP specifically specified goals around the reduction, uh, the elimination of poverty below the, lower, below the lower bound poverty line and the reduction of inequality. And I think we all know inequality in South Africa is a very, very big problem. Uh, it could be among the highest in the world, if not the highest. I think there's some countries that don't do a great job measuring it. But within Stats SA, even though from a policy framework it had set out to say that, you know, these are the two core objectives, inequality had always sort of been the the what do you say, the 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 step, the the unwanted stepchild of the two. So we had wonderful products around poverty. Uh, a lot of work around poverty lines that we developed and put into the field, building around our uh, multidimensional me uh, measures. We, we call it the SAMPI or the South African Multidimensional Poverty Index. So we had a whole variety of tools that tackled the poverty space. And then inequality was just a chapter or a section within these more grand uh, publications. And so we had never really fleshed out uh, the story of inequality. We had simply left it to the Gini coefficient. We have one thing, here's the Gini coefficient, we've measured it, and that's what we've done on inequality. And it was really only when ACER came about, I think they, they were founded in, in, in May 2017, or thereabout, uh, at, here at UCT. And we had had a long working relationship with, with Murray, um, and the people at Soldier and others, just in relation to the, the the nature of the data that we collect, and it was really at that point where we began having really intense discussions. AFD had come on board, brought some EU money that we got to really thinking out how can we put inequality on the same on the same level as 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 poverty. And there's actually it was an incredible collaboration. I actually think it for me it taught myself about inequality in the range of it. So it was not just the working to compile this report. There was so much more behind the scenes. It was the development of handbooks that would guide countries 
in how to 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 explore inequality uh, measures and indicators. It was tremendous amount of training provided through ACER, through AFD and UCT for, for these things. And it all culminated really in this fantastic joint publication that we published in 2019, uh, which which we, in, at least in Stats say call the ITR, or the Inequality Trends Report, which is our diagnostic. And it ultimately links to uh, a core strategic objective around interconnected statistical systems. I think we are now at a phase where we understand that there's so much data in, 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 the, in the data space that you almost have too much to know what you need to work with and where to begin. And so one of Stetsasei's core goals is really to, to, to build a data ecosystem that's sort of governed at the NSO level, that sort of brings together various administrative data from government, private data sources, a whole variety to get it into a system that then we can then uh, know that the data is is usable, it meets the necessary quality standards, and from there you can actually build out and branch out. And I think that's one of the next things to now say is we've done this inequality trends report. How can we improve on it? What more must we um, must we add? And so it is really through these partnerships that we want to 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 achieve that because I think it. it Anything when you do in the partnership, I think it leads to a better outcome. So that's to say, we're naturally, um, we're statisticians, but I wouldn't say we're hardcore statisticians. We're, we're more descriptive statistics. We, we're excellent at the data collection part. And I, over the last two years, have been re-energized to my roots when I joined in 2006 as Statsis A to the data collection side. But I think it's really with the partnerships that we can elevate the data that we collect to the next level. And it's 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 through through discussions like these that we can say how can we map it uh going going forward. Uh so let me see if I can work this clicker thingy. Uh, I'm pushing oh okay now things are going fast. Okay, there we go. So just just to give you a snapshot of this is our first one. This is the one we did in 2019. So you know, when we talk about the multidimensional nature, I think the first one I want to start with is really the data sources. Now, for me, my surveys are the first two, income and expenditure survey and the living condition survey. They're both household expenditure surveys, um, but uh, the, the LCS is a bit more of a, a wider ranging tool. It has a, more poverty objectives where the IES is traditionally a more of a CPI based um, instrument with then poverty added um, added in. But as you can see, when we approached this, we didn't just say, okay, well, what can we do with the IES and what can we do with the LCS data? We just say, what else is there? And so within stats to say, we're able to explore and dive into other data sets like the general household survey, the quarterly labor force survey, and of course, the, the censuses, which are the, 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 the ones that really give you the, 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 the lowest level data. But then we are also able to branch out Murray heavily involved with NIDS, which was a project sponsored by the presidency, which was a panel survey. Um, I think five waves that you you have of data that really provided. And then a lot of the work around the, the POMS, which is sort of the post-apartheid labor market series, which is sort of trying to harmonize the various labor market data sets, whether it be the quarterly labor force, the, pre, the earlier uh, labor force survey, which was once every six months and, and, and data from there. And we said, so let's see how we can work with all these data sources to tell uh, a multidimensional narrative around poverty. So it's not just looking at it from the from the one the one dimension. So obviously we explored uh, economic and asset and wealth inequality. Uh, this is sort of more where my where my 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 skills lie. Then we had labor market inequality, which I think is is when it comes to South Africa, I think the the bulk of the poverty situation, the inequality situation can all be correlated back to the situation of the labor market, uh, whether historically and the imbalances that have come from from uh, from the country's history, but even today and the the, the challenges we uh, we face. We also explored the social domain, uh, looking at education, health, basic services, and internet access. I think internet access in this day and age is not a luxury. It's not a nice to have. It is. Uh, 
it is it is essential for any household if they want to 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 coexist and and participate in today's economy and world gender inequality and social mobility so these were the ones so this is this is round one we put ourselves in the ring and this is what we what we came back with and said this is what we are going to tackle and it was mainly driven by the data availability element we said we've got these data sources um, and when it comes to the work that Stats does, we obviously um, we're cautious when it comes to working with outside data. We want to build the ecosystem that that grows and and can do it. But I think the big challenge that we have found is the actually getting data producers and data owners from outside, e even outside. And when I say outside Stats I mean including governments. So even Department of Basic Education, Department of Social Development. It, it's not, there's not a, a, people tend to, when it comes to data, I think hoard, you know, they t tend to protect, they tend to, this is mine and they don't really want to, 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 to share. So I think there's a lot of challenges around that. And, and, you know, that's still something we're growing, but these are the ones that we eventually said settled on and we, 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 we dug into. So it was, I think that gives you sort of then a snapshot of, where we were at the start of this project. And I think we were the first of the three countries to have produced our inequality diagnostic. And it was a it was really a fantastic collaboration. And I think the thing Murray did mention that I, I talked briefly was this handbook, which really was a step-by-step -step guide that Acer then provided to countries, which I'm sure with Ghana, with Kenya, can then take it as a playbook and and develop these tools. So this is where our starting block is. And I think today some of my other sides will talk about sort of where we are looking to improve. And I think the big question is then how do we bring climate into this? Because I think it is the, without a doubt, I, I mean, we could just open the uh, CNN or BBC or whatever new channel. And I promise you there's a flood somewhere that's breaking some sort of record or a hundred year uh, volcano that's exploding. It is every day we're seeing 500 year events happen back to back to back. And so we can no longer ignore this issue. And we have to recognize that inequality is very interlinked in this, just because how you respond to it, um, your conditions uh, has a big bearing. But I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over back to, to, to Anda and then I'll loop back in. Perfect, thank you so much. So what, what we wanted to use this, this site and this platform for is also to start to think through with you on how do we actually conceptualize these the, these linkages between equality and climate change, and how could we in the future get to adding and, and enhancing the inequality diagnostic by adding this climate change uh, dimension? So we started to think through how do we do this? And of course, when we think about the interlinkages between equalities and climate change, the first thing is to define the perimeter of analysis. With the South African diagnostic that we will be using as an example, well, of course, we, we looked at the equality in a country. When it comes to, to climate change, of course, we, we have the inequality of what and the inequality between whom. And there's a lot of talk around the inequality of emissions, for instance, between countries or inequalities of impacts, but this is less relevant for the inequality diagnostics per se. So we will just focus on in a given country, and then we would have this difference between inequalities of CO2 emissions or inequalities of, of emissions in general, and the inequalities of impacts. And this is where we could start to dwell a bit deeper on what do we actually mean by these what could be indicators, what can we measure to start to shape our thinking around it. So if we look at inequalities of, of emissions, a first step that we need to take is to identify um, the level of intensity of CO2 emissions in terms of consumption patterns. And then we would need to be able to link these consumption patterns to specific groups that have been identified in the diagnostic. So in, in almost all of the diagnostics, we have a, a minimum level of disaggregation where we look, of course, at vertical inequalities between individuals, but we'll also be looking at inequalities between urban and rural, uh, gender inequalities, inequalities uh, across individuals, depending on the level of education, and of course, inequalities 
between group of, between deciles uh, according to income. So, for instance, on education, we could look at inequalities of enrollment between uh, the poorest and the richest. So, let's say uh, decile one and, and and ten. So, we then need to identify a bit which are these groups and how do we link these consumption patterns to them. When it comes to inequality of climate change impacts, we need to make these two specific distinctions, which is one, um, which would be the unequal exposure to climate hazards per se, which is more the adaptation part. And then the other, which is more the unequal exposure to the ecological transition in itself. Um, so again, this is just our <laughs> so preliminary thinking of how can we start to identify indicators that could be relevant in order to measure these uh these interlinkages and i'm just gonna do a little bit on the unequal explo uh, exposure to, to climatic uh, hazards and to ecological transitions because this is where also we need to look deeper into what could be these indicators and how do we get the data to measure them if we think about exposure, uh, we would need to identify the sectors and the value chains at risk. So that would be, for instance, agriculture. Uh, and then we need to look at the sources of income also. So for instance, people who are more li most likely to work in agriculture would be most ex more exposed compared to others, et cetera. Another channel would be that of health impacts. And we do see also there are a lot of papers that are coming uh, out on uh, the unequal exposure to pollution and how this impacts health, uh, unequal exposure to heat as well. Um, and again, this entrenches inequalities even further because what we see is that, of course, it would be the most vulnerable that are most likely to be exposed to these. And also the, um, the identification of differential vulnerability to physical infrastructure impacts. Again, we, we saw that with the floods recently, it would be the most vulnerable uh, who live in informal housing, etc., that are most likely to be impacted, therefore, again, creating other inequalities. And then, of course, we would need to link these channels to the groups of, of population. When we think about the unequal exposure to the ecological transition, again, we need to identify the sectors and, and, and the value chains at risk. Here in South Africa, we there's a lot of talk about the, the just transition, just energy transition, and the coal value chains that are mostly at risk. Of course, the sources of income that are linked to this, um, but also the identification of the labor supply vulnerability. So this is a little bit of, we're still trying to, to get our, our heads, uh, heads around it. By what I wanted to say with this is that not all education uh, levels and not all, all skill levels of populations will be equally vulnerable. Of course, those who are less educated or have technical skills or specific technical skills that are probably more linked to uh, the, um, the sunset sectors will most likely be more impacted by the transition, therefore more likely to lose their sources of, of income. And again, we need to, once we identify the different channels, we would then need to link them back to the population groups. Now, you see all of this requires a lot of data that we don't necessarily have, <laughs> um, and also a lot of refining of the conceptual framework that we're thinking about doing in the next version of, of the handbook. But for now, we know that in order to get the data that would allow us to, to, to run through these analysis, we need to plan ahead quite a lot because the, this type of data would need to be included in the next surveys, et cetera. So I will then hand back to Werner so, can, so that he can also take us through what is planned for the next uh, inequality diagnostic in South Africa and what are some of the data challenges that we already see. Thanks, Anda. So I think Anda's now unpacked a bit of the, the framework around the, the climate side, about how do we begin thinking and, and, and shaping it. But I think what we also wanted to do is then say, well, while we're doing this, we can't do these things piecemeal. These things need to be parallel processes that are that are running. So I mentioned um, right now we're busy um, conducting the income and expenditure survey 2022-2023. And so that data, we, we're finishing data collection now, end of this month. 
And then we will next year we begin the the long process of all the the data confrontation, editing, cleaning, um, and we obviously have a a big chunk of work that we're going to do with CPI with the price statistics team to build the new CPI basket and to update the weights and things like that. So it it is a long process next year planned, ultimately with the goal of releasing the IES in in December 2024. Now with that release will then start the new cycle of products that will would come because the IES, uh, this will be the fifth uh, uh, expenditure survey in, in our series. We've actually been conducting them since 1995, but in 2005, six, that's to say switched over to a diary methodology. And so there's a big changes in the, in the sort of the composition of the data that we've collected. So we really begin our series in 2006 and this last report that we we talked about, at least when it comes to a lot of the economic asset and wealth um, issues, we really relied a lot on the, the 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 household expenditure data. So we had those four data points. We now have the fifth data point, which will provide us data for 2023. Um, and then that would then be the launching pad for us to begin the second edition of the inequality of trends report here in South Africa, which we we want to write and publish during the 2025-2026 financial year. Just for those not familiar with the African government, we begin our years in March, so it would be March 2025. Uh, April 2025 ends in March 2026. So when then that period, uh, the inequality trends report is not the only one we want to do, but it's one of the key central ones that we want to do. So obviously, um, with this new report comes other data sources. So we have a new IES, but we also have a new census that was just completed. The census 2022 uh, results were published last month, at least phase one. Phase two will be early next year where we begin preparing the 10% sample file and, 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 and other stuff. So that's just another data input that we're going to bring into this work. When we compiled the first one, we were still relying on the census 2011. So we published 2019 with 2011 data. That's an eight year data gap that existed. So it's already, you know, you we're already working sort of blind to some degree, but now we'll have at least this fresh data. Plus we'll have more data inputs from the general household survey and the quarterly labor force survey. The GHS is an annual one and the, the, the QLFS is obviously quarter. So these data inputs will then allow, allow us to say, let us do a second edition. And when we say what were the areas we needed to improve on? So the one obviously was sort of uh, the reliability of having sub-provincial data. Uh, The only key data sources that's that's to say that we provide is the census itself and the community survey, but the community survey itself only goes down to municipal, but with census, you can go all the way down to, to, to main place. But, the census only has itself 70 odd data items that you're working with. You cannot, you know, build this massive thing from it. You're working with a very, very limited set of, of items. And just from the census itself, we use 11 of those indicators in our, in our SAMPI or the South African multidimensional poverty um, index. But, Really, one of the goals is saying, how can we look at the sub-provincial level, especially moving to climate uh, issues, because things don't work at a provincial level when you then talk about uh, how it impacts. It impacts at a local level. It impacts neighborhoods and communities, and those their ability to respond is different. You cannot think at that higher uh, geographical level. You have to think and plan and analyze at that at that lower one. So this was a key weakness we had in the the first report. We'll now have fresh data, but I think we're still limited in this one. But I think this is where we need to begin thinking creatively about what data sources exist that we can complement or augment um, with 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 traditional household survey data uh, to uh, to achieving that. So I think that's that's the, the the one area. The other one is obviously access versus quality. Household surveys are great at measuring access to, but they do a very poor job of understanding the quality of those services. And when it comes to inequality, the quality of the service is is a very important aspect. And I think even more so when it begins 
uh, trying to filter into the climate space. Uh, because, you know, when you have, you know, um, you have, might have piped water on your on, on your land or on your plot or in your dwelling unit. But, you know, if the water is not clean or if it's not regular, if you get hit by a flood and now you don't have any other water to access, it's very different situations that you could be um, experiencing. So I think this is another area when we begin thinking now of of what new to bring into household surveys, we have to expand the quality dimension uh, more uh, to, to better understand that. And then lastly, the use of more administrative data. I think this ties in with the first point about the low level nature. I think some of the creative stuff we've tried to think about and try to do is, and I think a lot was done by Murray and his team with the NIDS where they began looking with the panel data and saying, okay, the, these households reside in this community. Let us map out um, the schools in the area and look at the, the school performances. Let's look at where hospitals are. And then you can begin, you don't necessarily need to have the data together in one data set, but you can begin overlaying the information to begin drawing conclusions. And I think that's a big one that we really need to, 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 to tackle. So I think, these are the things that we identified at the end of the first report that we said we need to think about going into the second one. As we go into the second one, I don't know how well we are on some of these issues, but I think it we need to keep it at the forefront of our minds because where I sort of wanted to, to just sort of end when we talk about new content is you saw the issues in, uh, that we talked about in the first one, but we say we need to add um, new content to further expand and improve the multidimensional nature of, of this work. And I think there's nothing more pressing than, than, than climate change and its ability to disrupt, um, to disrupt our society. I mean, if we just think of the impact on migration patterns that it's going to have, it's going to, we're going to see massive movements of populations. Are those changes then the areas they go to, maybe those had, sufficient services to cater for the community there. But when you have 100,000 refugees added to it, uh, climate refugees, how does that um, uh, uh, change? Uh, inequality is directly linked to almost all aspects when it comes to climate change, because we as individuals have different ways we can respond. It's my household. I've got resources that I can. If I don't have electricity, I can go get my generator and I can plug it in. If I need petrol, I can just go down and get some petrol. If you're out in a rural area, do you have those same abilities to, to respond? And those are the gaps that we need to begin thinking about, especially at the household level. So once we begin saying, this is the things, and I think Anda began painting a picture of some of the indicators that we need to be thinking about. But for me, we need to take a step further and say, I need data items that I can include in my, in my surveys so that I can have questions that I'm asking to households that then we can then use to get it. And I think the, 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 the survey, um, the statistical value chain, it's, it, it, it's quite a long process. I mean, if we think about the income and expenditure survey that I'm running right now, uh, that is all based off planning we did in 2019. You know, we had then a series of consultations and I think it was also the first digital uh, expenditure survey that we conducted. And I think what we found is that we're moving more and more into a, a space where it's harder. The, the, the real estate of questionnaires is getting more and more uh, pricey. I remember back in 2008, nine, when we were introducing the first living condition survey, I was engaging with researchers. They would send me, hey, I've got these 10 questions. Can you throw it in? Sure. Through in that, we we had sections upon sections of stuff that individual re researchers are saying, hey, this is something that I'm really uh, passionate about. One the the biggest section I think we added is around socially perceived necessities, work that Mike Noble and Gemma Wright were doing. And, you know, we were able to incorporate that into our into our instruments. But now we're finding the question is, what can we cut? And we're under tremendous pressure to make our questionnaires shorter. For me, the income and expenditure survey, expenditure surveys, if you understand them, are tremendously demanding on households. The, the respondent burden is through the roof. So 
in the, the job I'm now facing is what do I cut? Where do I cut? How much can I cut? And so the, the, the challenge of now saying, well, let's bring in other stuff. So what the point I'm trying to stress is in this age where the real estate and questionnaires is becoming more, more difficult to, to, to guarantee, we need to, as a sort of as a, the research community around these things, is really not just think about the indicators and the big picture that we want to tell, but we need to understand what are the specific questions we want to ask households. If we can only ask them 10, 20 questions around climate change, what are those data items? What are the response categories linked to those questions, right? We, and we need the, the, the more standard we can build it, the more we can do this as, a, as an international community to agree that these are the questions that makes when we have a, Ghana, a Ghanaian, a Kenyan, and a South African one, that we can make it comparable across countries, not just within country, but we can make it comparable across. So I hope from these discussions and what goes on that we can really begin narrowing down sort of a module that we feel strongly would would be the 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 the, the questions that could lead us to really having a very robust and 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 um, robust but useful practical information that policymakers can use to start making these um, these these decisions. And I think if we can do that, then it becomes a lot more easy to to advocate within the the, the statistical agency to say, this is something that it's not just something we want. This is something the international community wants. You know, we look to big frameworks, SDGs. Uh, we look to Agenda 2063 for on the African continent, right? We look internally, the National Development Plan, the medium-term strategic framework, right? We take our cue from these from these things to determine our questions. And so we need to we need to compete in that space. And it, if we are going to start answering these questions, we need to decide on those questions now because it's going to take time to put it into the questionnaire, to go into the field, collect the data, and then come back out and then be able to have it. So I'm hoping that with, with the work we're doing here today, now uh, when we look to our third edition of the, 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 the next inequality trends report, that we can have the robust climate data collected at least in one of these survey vehicles that we can then incorporate. And then when we say, what did we cover? We've got this beautiful little additional bullet point, climate inequality. And I think it's, it's, there's no shortage of, of things that can be done there, but I think we have to be practical. And we have to also think, what is relevant to a household versus you know, a community or a government. Because I think some of these things around climate change, when you think of, uh, it's not maybe the household's place to give an answer, but it's them who's being impacted. So it's, you know, we just need to think and, and shape our, 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 our minds around that. So I think that's where, where uh, my spiel, let us, if I can get me the, the, those questions and those data items, then I can make sure that our surveys begin featuring these things and I can advocate and lobby for their inclusion in not just the next IES, but in practice other uh, survey vehicles. But I think climate change is one of those areas that's going to force our hands. Well, we might not be doing it now, but soon I'm sure we will have very dedicated modules to it because of its relevance to, to all of our lives as we move forward. So I'll hand it back to you then, Anda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so you have listened to our message. Do give us ideas and questions, ideally. And uh, I will uh, invite our colleague from the ILO, Jens, if you'd like to reflect a little bit on how this also sees, is being perceived from, uh, from the ILO, who is also championing these issues. So. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Anda. And uh, yeah, where to start? This is a big topic, huh? I mean, uh, you know, adding the dimension of uh, of climate change to in the inequality space, and and for sure we know it's going to be, you know, you know, climate change, as you said, Verna, is uh, is impacting, you know, everything we do, life and planet, and life and planet and livelihoods is at stake for sure. 
So, um, so I'm with the ILO very quickly. I'm, um, I don't know, do I need to explain what the ILO is? Because sometimes I think it might be good to understand how the ILO is, is actually a tripartite organization. We are the only United Nations agency that is made up of uh, employers, workers, and governments. So when a country is a member of the ILO, it is workers. So all workers in the world that are represented in, in, in trade unions, and workers, organizations, private sector that is uh, represented by employers and business member organizations, and then of course governments. So we, when, when I say I'm from the ILO, I'm actually from the International Labor Office which is representing the constituents. So we are there to serve member states like South Africa in, in their choices. So when it comes to, um, comes to um, your, I, I think I've been asked, uh, asked to talk a bit about the, what tools do you have available in the ILO in terms of looking at diagnostics and the impact of climate change on the world of work, on labor markets and so on and so forth. And we can talk forever about this because that's just to say that the, the concept of just transition entered the ILO debate first around you know, the turn of the century, actually. And it, the, the, the term just transition actually stems from the North American trade union movement, which back in 98 talked about you know, the impact of workers on climate protection policies in the US at the time. So they said if there are climate protection policies and their impact on jobs, you know, we, no, we need to be part of that process. We need to be part of that transition and it needs to be fair in the sense that there need to be new job opportunities, there need to be new skilling and reskilling and upskilling opportunities and so on and so forth, right? And then it entered the ILO debate, um, you know, and I think around 2013 was first discussed at the International Labor Conference. Then, you know, the ILO, we created the Green Jobs Program because we are the ILO. What are we concerned about? We are concerned about jobs. We are concerned about employment. We are concerned about social protection. We are concerned about a link to inequality for sure because lack of employment, lack of a good job, you know, lack of social protection is very often correlated with, you know, inequalities. And, and we see that. So, but so from a from a just assessment perspective and climate change adaptation and mitigation but adaptation perspective, I mean, the ILO, I think we can say without certainty, without any uncertainty and without any shed of doubt that, you know, the the um, the, the rate of climate change and moving towards environmentally, environmentally sustainable economies and society, it is going to cost jobs. We know that for sure. Yeah? Um, in, in, in some industries, but ultimately the transition to low carbon economies will also create jobs. And I think it's always been like that, hasn't it? You know, when the world has gone through these different phases of the uh, transformations, we call them the industrial revolutions from the first industrial revolution from where we move from very agrarian societies to more modern societies and so on and so forth. You see that there's a disruption, that labor markets are being disrupted uh, and so on and so forth. Just think about the postal service now, huh? I mean, with internet and, and so on and so forth. Um, and mailmen back in the UK around uh, across the world at the turn of the century, those, those jobs no longer exist. So in terms of what I've been asked to talk about and how long time do I have? Five, 10 minutes? Five minutes, okay, so I, I'll try to be, so, um, so, so in terms of tools we have available, uh, let me talk about three three different things. So at one level, we have what I call the the global reports that analyze global trends and drivers in employment and in the world of work. Then we have some modeling tools uh, for green jobs assessment, which is an economic modeling tool. And then we have various types of skills anticipation tools looking at how does the labor markets, how are they being impacted and how can we anticipate the skills that are needed in certain industries and sectors, right? So, uh, at the global level, we have, uh, I think, an excellent report, one of the ILO flagship reports called the World Economic and Social Outlook. So this report, um, you know, looks at um, looks at global and regional analysis, and uh, very often ILO constituents are involved in the in 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 the um, in the collection of data, validation of data, and so on and so forth. And these um, these reports, um, if, if you take a look at 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 if, well, if I can say, typically these reports would also try to capture important trends or global trends, such as, for instance, um, the impact of the coronavirus and pan uh, pandemic on labor markets, uh, geopolitical tensions and conflict, like we see across the world and in some regions right now uh, happening. Uh, I would look at labor migration. As you said, Bernard, climate change is really going to impact labor migration. What are the jobs also in those host communities? 
where migrants are moving to and so on and so forth. So we do a lot of analysis around that level. And perhaps uh, just let me mention one, one report, which is the World Economic Social Outlook Report from 2018. It's actually called Greening with Jobs. And I won't, I have a lot of data I can go into, but it actually looked at how is um, the global um, uh, labor markets, how are they going to be impacted by, by climate change and environmental depletion and the adap adaptation to low carbon economies, but what are the new opportunities that are coming? So for instance, that report analyzes the loss of jobs in traditional energy production used by fossil fuels and so on and so forth, but also looks at what are the new number of jobs that are being created around the production of renewable energy sources and so on and so forth. And there, the ILO in that report actually came out and um, and said that, you know, we are going to lose something like, uh, like um, how many jobs? Um, I'm trying to look at my figure here. I forget it. Um, I think uh, job losses of around 6 million, but then job creation of 24 million in renewable energy sector. So that's actually a net increase of 18 million jobs globally, just in renewable energy, right? Um, and then something, please allow me, and you know, something that inspired me by, by what you said, how can we actually um, adapt indicators that also captures uh, climate change issues, right? And the 2023 ILO uh, World Economic Social Outlook Report, it's simply called Trends 2023, actually, looks at the potential um, for Africa uh, to adapt to climate change. What are the type of jobs that are be being created you know, to adapt to climate change? And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, uh, there's something called the Notre Dame Global Adaption Initiative, ND Game, from Notre Dame University in Indiana, the US. And they they use a composite of different type of indicators looking at what they, what they call the vulnerability. And I think very close related to inequality. And here they look at indicators across health systems, food, um, habitat, water, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And then they look at what is called readiness. So, you know, in terms of social, economic, uh, and governance uh, readiness. So, how well is a country prepared to govern that adaptation? Uh, how is there, how, how will their economy is able to respond, and so on and so forth. And, and the ILO, what we actually did back then, we took that index and then we did some, I think, some fascin fascinating modeling work uh, using the ND index. And uh, we showed how low resilience um, to climate change is actually also closely related to decent work deficits. So basically what you see that the data shows that an increasing vulnerability to climate change directly correlates to an increasing rate of informal employment as a proxy for indecent work, so decent work deficits, right? So I think so that's perhaps something we can look into. It, it's a fascinating index and you might be able to get some um, some indicators from that. Then I won't go into any more at this level, but then in terms of macroeconomic modeling, we have a, um, a modeling tool called the Green Jobs Assessment Tool, and it looks also at the effects on labor markets. And, and it's an evidence-based economic model and planning tool to better understand not only employment, but also social impacts uh, of green economy and climate policies that enables government to, to create just transition policies. So, so this model was born out of the need to support countries in assessing the effects of climate policies and jobs and identify options to maximize job gains uh, minimize losses, but also to ensure just transition policies. So basically, let me just quickly explain it, and then I move on. It's based on national accounting frameworks. We heard a lot of data where you're getting your uh, inequality data from Werner, and what we are looking at here is also we are drawing from available uh, data already. So it's based on national accounting frame frameworks set up by international standards. So on the one hand, we have the system of national accounts and the international standard industry classification, ICIC, right? Uh, then expands the industries into environmental and economic accounts. And then the classifications on employment status and occupation are used to provide accurate information in, in terms of employment characteristics in conventional, but also in green industries. And environmental statistics such as carbon emissions, uh, energy and water use um, are added in physical quantities to the conventional and green industry. And then the model then subsequently integrates data at the um, in, into a 
single and consistent framework uh, where we are using supply and use tables, so SUT tables, input output tables, and social accounting matrices, Sam. And then it combines all this data uh, with employment and other so source data from labor, uh, labor household service, from quarter labor force service, and so on and so forth, and environmental data from emissions, from emissions <clears throat> which we all not see in these type of uh, inequality index. So perhaps you can look at that. And then, you know, it simultaneously, simultaneously provides evidence for policy, policy advice for economic, social, and environmental questions at the industry level. So what you end up with is, you know, collating all of, compounding all of these uh, this uh, data together, and, and then we end up with the with the green, the green jobs assessment model. And basically, what it's answering then, it's a macroeconomic modeling tool that we've been training South African National Treasury on this tool actually. So what some of the questions you can answer is how many direct and indirect jobs for men and women are created and are lost in certain alternative policy scenarios, um, which economic sectors benefit from the policies, which ones will require restructuring, as we're seeing with the, with the coal value chain in South Africa, how many technicians, and I think this is important, professionals, non-skilled and other occupational type of profiles do you need and so on and so forth. Huh? So this is a very interesting uh, model that uh, is also being used by the global uh, network called GAIN, Glo Green Jobs Assessment Institutions Network, where some South African University of Pretoria is actually part of this. Finally, two minutes, and then I'll wrap up. So, so that's the high level, global level. We look at uh, macroeconomic models. We support many, many countries to do that. But then finally, we also have a number of tools in the skills area, looking at you know, how can we anticipate the need for skills for green jobs in certain occupations. Um, and we have a number of tools to also try to analyze the anticipating and matching skills and jobs. And basically what this looks is at is some sort of the, some of the global drivers of change. For instance. So here, you know, globalization of markets, um, changes in work organization, you know, rapid technological changes and how that is influencing a, a work. We look at demographic changes labor migration, we look also growing youth populations across the world in some areas, older populations and other areas, we look at climate change. Uh, and then we look at, you know, different types, you know, increasing education attain attainment across the world. <laughs> so basically we try to look at what are the effects between skills demand and skills supply in labor markets and how can you actually uh, very often there's a mismatch and that mismatch is going to grow as we adapt to climate change. So how can we try to, to you know, go into that space and anticipate what are the type of skills that are needed? And I have a lot of technical notes on how to do that, but I won't, uh, I won't bore you with that. Perhaps just a final, a final reflection from my side in terms of, uh, and something you said, let me just look at my note, uh, exactly you said and uh, this, inequality on in terms of impact but also in terms of emissions and if you look at africa you know is responsible for something like three percent of global emissions but has close to 18 percent of the, the world's population and it's growing and it's increasing every year you know of course there's some sort of uh, inequality in that data in itself right and this is also what the south african government is arguing you know coal is going to be part of our inner energy mix for a very long time because we have no other options and now you've been polluting now let's give us our turn a bit i mean that's the narrative right but one thing i just want to say and this is my closing comment and is what we see i think in high income countries uh, is that the green transition in economic and employment policies are driven by two factors first a, a drive to agree to achieve greater energy efficiency and renewable energy use right and we see that happening and industrialized countries are making a lot of advances in, while also then reducing the negative environmental impacts. But then the second one is the rising trend in markets for green goods and services. There's a lot of demand in European and OECD countries that you yet don't see in, in, in low income countries, right? So, and this is coming back to the dilemma because in low income countries, the environment and climate change and resource depletion has a more di direct impact and a more direct bearing on people's lives. And those are the countries that are most likely to be affected by climate change and environmental degradation, which in turn, over time, will have an impact on the growth prospects of these countries, so the GDP and so on and so forth. So I think that's a dilemma. 
And then coming to your point about skills, that not all professions and vocations, I made a note here, are impacted equally. And what we see when it comes to the most important changes taking place in skills and occupations for green economy, they are taking place at a relatively higher skill level, often tertiary, well, vocational training, technical education, and at university, when in fact we see the majority of population across the world don't have access to that type of education. So I think it's multidimensional. There are so many, so many, so many areas. And if anyone is interested in having more data, or more information on some of these economic models and our modeling tools, I mean, I'm happy to share. Hope it wasn't too long. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't there are any questions on this first part of the session that was more focused on climate change related inequalities, uh, or if there are any reactions from the from the colleagues. I don't have on the uh, on from our online participants if we have any questions. We have two questions here. I will always give priority to the online participants because they don't get to get the coffee and right. the snacks. Uh, but uh, unless I'm mistaken, there are no questions as of yet. So I'll just give the mic to the colleagues here, Ellen, Alessandro, and Miguel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was very interested in the forthcoming data uh, survey uh, by, by StatSA. So you mentioned a lot of the household surveys for including climate uh, data, but uh, uh, what about the other kind of uh, surveys you were mentioning? And uh, all in all, how many questions do you think it would be worth to, to be, uh, what kind of space would we have? Because it's important to determine, you know, the discussion and the and the, the space and the you know the ambition we have on this issue. Thank you. Good morning, Alessandro Batazzi, ILO. Um, two 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 brief questions. One uh, regarding uh, the 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 tools in general, in the sense that you hinted a bit at how they were used in terms of uh, influencing the policy making, and I was wondering if you could talk about how. Uh, the data was the, the 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 ITRs were actually used to inform the the priorities, the policy making process, and so on. Um, from in South Africa, but if you also have examples from the other countries, that would be great. Uh, second, I I I I know that uh, as you said, the real estate in the in the service is is uh, <laughs> increasingly limited. But um, when you when you um, you said that you're you're gonna look a little more into the internet access aspect. And and obviously the the there it's also the question of access in terms of quality as well. But one one question that I had was, um, it when you when you talk about in, you know the, the the digital skills, the ability to also use that, that service. So I was wondering whether that is also an aspect that you're capturing, uh, that you want to capture, and if yes, and how. Thank you. Ah, thank you, and so Miguel Nino from the SOAS University of London. So thank you very much. It was really fantastic. Uh, um, obviously, the the uh, the focus was on data, which I think is very uh, a very important point. But one of the things that we also know is that the link between climate change and inequality is not very very well understood. You no. Know? So I just want to to understand or know what is the work that you've been doing to because data efforts should be linked to more conceptual and theoretical work. So I just want to to know what you've been doing on that respect. Thanks. Thank you so much. No other questions for now, and I think no questions from the Zoom participants for now. No, OK. Um, I, I can start with the last question, and then I'll give up. But I think both very, very you need you guys need to come here because of, for the participants this year. So we're starting the work on the conceptual side. We did uh, different types of, of work that are now feeding into that. So for instance, within the EUIFD research facility, um, in the first phase of it, we did some work around uh, very environmental variability and income inequality. Right now, we're trying to focus a little bit more on, for instance, marine protected areas with the colleagues in Indonesia and inequalities. Um, we're looking at environmental taxes and inequality as well. Uh, and we're planning to do a sort of framing document where we retrace the different links and try to understand 
what could be actually the type of indicators that we could look at, et cetera. And that would be a building block for the next version of the handbook. But we are just starting and that's why I wanted to have all your good ideas as well uh, on this. I will give the floor to Werner. Chris. Thanks. Um... Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to answer in any particular order. I think there was a, a couple. The one issue I think was echoed in sort of two two spaces. It was about the the availability of space in in questionnaires and and sort of the way forward on that. So I think the one thing I've spoken about is the the, the demand for space and the difficulty in sort of meeting that demand. Where I think back with the old paper, the Pappy approach, when you're doing a paper, it was there was more luxury. I don't even know how to describe it where now in the digital space, it, it isn't so much. So I think how Stats SA is responding is we are looking to sort of re-engineer our household survey program. So we spoke, I spoke a lot about the, the IES, the general household survey, the quarterly labor force survey, censuses and these things. I think what we're trying to move towards um, which we were calling the the CPS or continuous population survey is is really a, a, a new survey vehicle that integrates various survey instruments and the ones we're really targeting is the 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 expenditure survey so the IES and the LCS but then also what we call in our CDC program so that would be the general household survey the domestic tourism survey and also the governance justice and 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 uh, GSP, justice survey. I can't remember the full full acronym. So we're looking to integrate these surveys into a new survey vehicle that would be continuous. So uh, the big challenge with the expenditure surveys is they're very periodic. And because they're so expensive, we found, especially in South Africa and the, the, the tight fiscal environment, there's just not resources to run these surveys very, very frequently. So we're trying to better organize ourselves around this new integrated uh, survey vehicle that would then allow us to basically rotate in and out modules more frequently, right? So the, the, the question doesn't then become every year, do we need to know, um, do we need to know every year about uh, school dropout rates or, uh, you know, access to electricity? I mean, these things change fairly gra um, slowly. So, you know, it, when we now move to this new model, it gives us an opportunity to say, how can we build a more modular approach to this so that we can, A, respond more quickly to emerging issues? I think climate's not an emerging issue. I, it, will, it is because there's still so much to, to explore, but it's, it's so big and so um, its impact is going to be so monstrous. In, in in so many ways, I think Jen, you pointed a nice of making it seem the positives that with all the change and the disruption, that at least maybe more jobs can come out of it at the end of the day. Maybe we lead to better livelihoods uh, down 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 the road. So I think that would then give us an opportunity to better manage the space in questionnaires, and it would allow us to then say, rather than having maybe a, a, a strict module of, say, 20 questions in our climate section, we can think more holistically of saying, well, what, what are the issues we need to know and at what frequency? And then we can maybe calibrate and say, you know, we have a climate module that looks at these issues and it sort of changes over time and we can loop back and we can build a time series out of out of that so i think that's how we're looking to to sort of manage the space i think that's one of our big challenges now um is is to build this it's not just to to better organize ourselves it's also to achieve that one issue i spoke about was our biggest weakness sub-provincial data right by integrating these surveys we hope to be able to say rather than just providing estimates reliable down to a province that now we can look at a district level, right? We in South Africa, we've got the the president's uh, district development model, the DDM, and so we want to make sure our survey vehicles are responsive to those issues and to the indicators that has been set forth by the presidency to say um, this is what we need to track and understand. And our long term is to hopefully build that vehicle down to a municipal level, 
were so that whether we have a rolling sample, simply bigger sample sizes, or or whatever avenue we go, and I think these are the critical decisions we still need to 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 to, to tackle, we will be able to cover more um, more topics more quickly because you know now slotting in a module now is can be done more easily rather than having to wait and incorporate into the value in the the regular statistical value chain of of a survey's life cycle you can respond more quickly and then hopefully with the data that we're collecting we can now also drill down to that lower level so it's meeting a whole bunch of objectives and it provides then the opportunity to then um, bring in this new um, this this new content. I think with the regards to the internet access, the the digital skills that you need, you're right. You can have access to internet, but can you use it effectively? Um, right now, I don't think our our our, our questionnaires properly uh, evaluate the, the the level of skill that that people have. I think it comes back to an issue of access versus qu quality. Right, there's an element of quality. Do you, how can you use it? How effectively can you use it? Uh, so I think that's that's one of the things that we'll need to 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 explore more. But right now, I don't think we do a good job of of being able to answer. Do our people have the skills? And then I think from the policymaker side, I think this is, you know, as a statistician, I like to we 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 like to think ourselves a bit of apolitical. We provide the information. And we provide it to the policymakers and then let them make the decisions for it, right? If we get involved, um, then we sort of have our agenda that we are pushing from the side. So we, we pride ourselves on our independence from it. But I think our goal is just to make sure that these things are accessible, understandable to policymakers so that they can draw real world conclusions. And I think Unda and Murray had done a lot post our release of the, the the thing in 2019 of course covid came in and i think totally disrupted the 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 plans we had but i know in early 2020 we had a very exciting uh meeting with 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 policymakers where we really pushed the platform and said this is what's available this is how you can use it and i think murray can i think expand a bit more on that as well thank you uh, i'll i'll start by saying that sometimes uh people who keep saying, yeah, our job is to produce the data that can shout into the policy space quite loud, depending on how the space is configured. And I guess that was my point about the platform that was laid through, this, the, through the diagnostic process, because uh, Werner spoke quite benignly about the fact that the National Development Plan in South Africa had uh, highlighted poverty inequality and unemployment as the sort of triple challenges of the country and that's just like a glib it flows off the mouth very easily the inequality side never got proper attention ever uh it was just like oh yeah that's part of the triple challenges right and if we handle poverty and if we focus on growth we'll handle unemployment and we're on our way uh, and so this whole focus on an inequality trends report and inserting it into the national information system and the process that, that, that was involved in these stakeholder engagements get real power from the fact that that's the statistical agency saying, no, this was said in the national development plan. Now we're going to actually measure this in a multidimensional way that shows you the intersections, shows you it's not the same thing as poverty. Uh, that's incredibly powerful. And I think that resonated across the continent uh, as the, that's that's the power of the platform. Did we achieve anything? Well, well, that's the achievement in a sense as a platform um, and not to be to be understated and making the point about the, the way the society hangs together. What does an inequality perspective have to bring that these other perspectives don't? Well, it's that interrelationship and the intersectionality, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, of and and uh, but that said, obviously diagnostics are are what they are. They have their limits. They're not analytic. Uh, they just but what they do do is marshal these many dimensions and and correlate them, and uh, and and stimulate the discussion. And then in the stimulation in the South African case, we also had a direct impact on a very nice working relationship with the SDG office that's responsible for South Africa's annual reporting into the SDG process. And so 
if you look at the SDG process on 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 goal ten on inequality, basically you've got to cough up some Gini coefficients, and if you don't do it, then somebody's going to do it for you, right? Some somebody from Colombia, for example, is going to tell the world what South Africa looks like on its inequality performance. Um, and uh, so this this inequality trends report says, okay, but as Werner spoke very nicely, like that Gini coefficient obscures as much as it reveals about South Africa's inequality and the texture of the, and it's a terrible high level indicator, even high level. It's just doesn't really do the job, except to tell South Africa, everybody that South Africa has extreme inequality off the charts. But what's the consequence of that? Well, if you dive into the trend, the, the trends report, you begin to get a sense of the consequence of that. And, and then the discussion gets stimulated and it's about the intersections and the, who's, who's getting ahead, who's falling behind, what, what is, where's the South African society going? Um, and Werner was right. I think in the COVID, the platform that was laid by the Inequality Trends Report enabled this country to move way beyond where it would have been able to move when COVID hit and everybody started saying, oh, this really tells us about our inequalities. But, you know, that was just like, at, at some point, it's insulting to the people who are battling to survive through COVID, right? But with the Inequality Trends Report having done its job, we were able to push on and say, yeah, this is what it means, right? We, we just, uh, we, we replicated the analysis, but with a particular focus on COVID vulnerability. Um, so that platform gets there. And the same happened in Ghana. And exactly the same happened in, in Kenya, actually, that the platform that was laid was very effective. And then it did stimulate, if you have these discussions and you get, get, the, get that discussion going, then, of course, you do do more, much more detailed work. So in each of the countries, uh, ASA was asked to, to do uh, benefit incidence work like complementary, okay, can we push a bit harder into the performance of policy in, in overcoming inequality? I wouldn't say we shouldn't be too aggressive in how well we did, but we did the sort of profiling of, okay, our social expenditures and our tax policies, what do they look like? So, uh, and it goes to then the session of, okay, you need to push on with some more detailed information in particular areas that you're working in. And, and I guess after tea, we'll pick up on one of those areas. Um, and the climate change, yeah. Okay, I'll get, I need to stop, I'm told. Uh, but so in each of the three countries though, some of this, you know, uh, uh, tax modeling work and um, and benefit in expenditure modeling and tax modeling work was, was stimulated and then integrates around that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. There's no T actually. Now, it, it will be too complicated to break for tea for our online participants. So we're just going to continue. If anyone wants tea, the tea is just outside the room. So we're going to move forward. Um, thank you again for the, this far, first part. And as it was mentioned, uh, the ILO has been uh, moving towards addressing inequalities and have set up a strategy specifically on addressing inequality. So it was interesting for us also to bring the two strands of work together and to hear more about the tools that are being developed on the ILO side, your presentation there. Yeah. Um, and, um, and for that, we have Alessandro. So I'm gonna give the floor and the presentation will show up in a couple of seconds. Thank you, Anda. Good morning, uh, Alessandro Batazzi, Work Quality, ILO Geneva. Um, and it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you to AFD and to University of Cape Town. Uh, so yeah, I'll be I'll be talking a bit about the um, complementing what Jens was saying earlier, the work that we're doing on inequalities, um, which essentially started at the end of last year operationally, but it's something that we have been reflecting on for, for quite some time. Um, and then I'll introduce um, our colleague, Miguel Nino Zarazua, who will uh, be talking about some of the work that he's doing uh, for us to help us move forward in the development of tools. Um, now, um, we have, I don't want to talk about what we're doing on inequalities as a separate track from what we're doing in terms of uh, of just transition and, and green jobs. It's something that are uh, mutually reinforcing, that we're working together as a one ILO. Uh, but briefly, the, the ILO has been working on inequality more or less since its inception. It's something that it's part of. It's 
um, apologies, it has been is part of its constitution since 1919, in the sense that the constitution talks about um, universal and lasting peace, peace that can be achieved only if it is based upon social justice, and achieving social justice can only be done if inequalities are uh, reduced. Um, the, um, it also calls for, among other things, equal remuneration for work of equal value, um, policies to ensure a just share of the fruits of progress to all. And these principles were recalled by uh, subsequent documents as well, the 1944 Declaration of Philadelphia, the Centenary Declaration of, of uh, 2019. And more recently, um, in um, 2018, the governing body decided to have a, a specific discussion on an ILC. Now, then COVID happened, so it was an immediate, it actually took some time, um, but in 2021, this discussion actually take pl took place, focusing on inequalities in the world of work, which manifests um, manifest across dimensions, uh, vertically, horizontally, uh, especially it's linked to other topics, including uh, climate change, of course. And just transition um, and eventually we ended up with a comprehensive and integrated strategy that was endorsed by the governing body in november of last year and this has become our guiding document in terms of operationalization and i want to highlight some aspects of this strategy um, because this really um can give an idea of the reflections that we're having to then develop diagnostic tools or not just to develop, but also to work with partners to maybe adapt existing ones. And I'll, and I'll come a little bit later to that. So the strategy has uh, these uh, mutually reinforcing and interrelated um, guiding principles for its operationalization. And some of them clearly reflect the mandate of the organization, the importance of social dialogue and tripartism, because that is our comparative advantage. We can bring in different aspects of society um, in, in a way that other organizations can, not that they do it their own way, we do it this way. Uh, fundamental principles on rights of work and international labor standards, which are uh, directly linked to different dimensions and drivers of inequality. Um, but also attention to root causes of inequalities, its drivers and determinants across all dimensions, which is something that if we were to have a specific inequality diagnostic tool, it's something that we would have to uh, take into consideration. Addressing both distribution and redistribution, because we're trying to tackle both at the same time, which is um, fundamental to ensure that you can both prevent and reduce inequalities in the world of work. And the strategy also, uh, identifies seven thematic areas for priority action. If you want, um, I like to refer to them, maybe the colleagues won't, won't be happy with that, but as policy containers in the sense that these are areas that speak also to a number of other um, policies. Employment creation is not just um, you know private sector creating jobs, it also requires microeconomic uh, frameworks. It, requ it requires working also on um, well, on gender equality, non-discrimination, equality for all diversity and inclusion. They are interrelated as well. Um, um, we have equal access to education, skills, lifelong learning. We have labor protection. We have um, transition to the formal economy, which is both an area for policy work and a conditio sine qua non for decent work for all. Uh, social protection, trade. And what we're doing right now is working on these to develop country-specific approaches in pilot countries at the moment. Now, the strategy also calls for the production of knowledge and evidence and research, including in partnerships with other organizations, which is why being part of this event is so important for us. And again, thank you so much for having us. But also the importance to develop uh, practical tools and adapt existing ones in cooperation again with other organizations because we can't go at this uh, together. I think no one can. Um, and so <laughs> very obviously we have two ways forward. On the one hand, we need to develop specific tools on inequalities in the world of work. But on the other, we also need to see what we have in house because we have a range of practical tools um, and how we can reinforce the inequality cap component if you want now um stuck no okay um just before this so um one of the first things that we're doing right now which miguel will be talking about is developing a conceptual framework on inequalities in the world of work because 
while we have a discussion report, we have a strategy, we need to expand a little more uh, our understanding of what inequalities in the world of work are, what the drivers are, what the diff how it relates also to other dimensions, so that then we can start building tools to um, move towards the policy recommendation to our constituents and, and, and member states. Miguel will be talking a little more about that. Um, I'll be giving an example of an existing tool that we have and how it offers the possibility for, um, I don't like the term mainstreaming, but for the sake of clarity for mainstreaming, reinforcing if you want the inequality capturing element again. And, and this complements a bit uh, what, what Jens was speaking about earlier in terms of the tools at our disposal. The green employment diagnostics. This is a tool that um, the employment labor, uh, labor market and youth branch um, in, uh, in Geneva is, uh, has worked on. And it's a tool that um, it's, it's quite topical, I think, this week because it looks uh, at the impact of climate change, the potential of uh, green uh, transition and how it relates to the labor market to identify um, the best way forward, quote unquote, the challenges and opportunities for sustainable pathways towards uh, productive em employment for all in low and middle income countries. Because again, the ultimate objective of the ILO is su to support its member states and constituents with um, finding their own solutions, their own policies uh, to tackle these, these challenges. And um, the, the tool has four core, core pillars. Um, oh, I have it here in front as well. <laughs> um, the first one obviously being uh, climate change and environment. So it looks at, um, at you know, the context vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the phenomena, the, the trends, the frequency, the severity, the impact of, on the economy and the labor market in a general way, because then there's the, also the economy and the labor market pillars that go a little bit more into detail. Um, and how the economy and the labor market are, are changing um, because of a transition to a low carbon economy. Then the economy pillar looks a little more specific at the impact on an aggregate level, but also across sectors. Um, and, um, and also what type of responses are being put in place um, to face these challenges. Then there's the labor market pillar. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll just move on to the to the last one, which is the poverty and inequality pillar, which explores how people's welfare characteristics are impacted by the changes in the labor market. Now, um, this is a pillar that um, I, I was discussing with the colleagues, and they're saying that this is something that needs needs. Um, it's still in early stages. They're still testing exactly what type of results they're getting when the, when they're applying it. Um, I I unfortunately don't have a specific example where they've tested it. But um, first, obviously, they start with country profiling. So they look at uh, generally at some indicators to get some um, some idea of the context. In this case, they look at um, the poverty rate, the percentage of people, uh, percentage of population having access to modern cooking fuels, um, people having uh, access to electricity, and the Gini index as a measure of a country's income and inequality levels. And obviously, these are um, only some indicators. You could look at it at a number others. Uh, but this is, I'm just showing you the one, the, the indicators from the poverty and inequality context. There are others that are complementing uh, in the other pillars as well. Following that profiling, then there's the assessment level where you look at the possible implications also in terms of the physical impact, the um, risks presented by the impacts of, tra uh, of, of transition and the opportunities as well, which are not... I don't want to be. Um, I don't want to say that there are similar reflections to what what we saw earlier in your presentations, but I think that there's there's a link there in some way, and and I think um, you know we're here to learn from each other, and I can definitely learn from you guys in that sense on how you're looking at these things. Um, um, and some of the guiding questions, just to show um, some of them that uh, the diagnostic is looking at. Um, Again, some of these we already we already spoke about, it, but I wanted to highlight that in a way there's both the vertical aspect, vertical inequality considerations, because it's looking at the impact on the the lower uh, segments of the income distribution. It's looking at disadvantaged groups. Um, 
and and I thought that in a way there's also the spatial aspect because it's not looking not just um, at, again at vertical and horizontal but also at the occupational and geographic profiles of the new jobs being created. So who are they? Are they skilled or unskilled? And also where are they? In what part of of uh, of, a, of a specific country? Which I thought is is um, you, you know when you read something and you think oh my god that that is obvious but I I didn't think about it and I'm glad that it's there. Let's put it like that. Now, um, so as I said, this is just one example of tool, and and um, there are others depending on the other thematic areas. There's there are skills diagnostics, informality diagnostics, um, but this is one where we're trying to reinforce a bit the inequality component. And now we're also trying to work on an inequality diagnostic toolkit. Uh, but I'll, I'll hand it over to Miguel to talk a bit about the conceptual framework and what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me and also for the invitation uh, to attend this particular session. I am very excited to be here. My name is Miguel Nino Sarasua. I am from SOAS University of London in the economics department. And uh, well, for some time, I've been working with, um, with several colleagues on, on the issue of inequality. And, uh, and then recently with Alessandro, we have a conversation about how to incorporate the work that they've been doing for a very long time um, in, a, in a more perhaps comprehensive way, not try to develop a conceptual framework that can guide the discussions about inequality, in particular in the work of work. No? So the, the focus is specifically on this area. No? So, and obviously um, the, the challenge here is how to incorporate the multi the multiple dimensions of inequality, also to underscore uh, the main root causes of inequality. So uh, in order to address those roots through policy, and also what kind of policy innovations at the moment we know work for dealing with these particular challenges. Um, and obviously the final point in this conceptual framework is to understand the data that we need to be able to measure and also monitor uh, uh, monitor progress towards reducing inequalities in these dimensions. So, um, one of the things that uh, we um, we are well, we are in fact um, in an early stage. We are already working. So, if you have suggestions, obviously, we are very. I will be very helpful, uh, uh, grateful for that. So we. Uh, work around the idea of the world of work around these two uh, dimensions. When one is uh, different forms of work, the other one are different manifestations that come through the labor market, you no, know, captured by employment. But there are different kinds of indicators that capture this relationship between individuals and the labor market. You know? and I think this is important because um, so far we have done a lot of work on labor market issues, but not really around work, no? So this is one of the things that also the conceptual framework is trying to capture in the analysis. And one of the things, you know, this is a, a nice chart that I'm borrowing from the ILO that in a way encapsulates these divisions, no? So far, the focus has been on employment, which normally manifests um, in the exchange of work for pay or profit, but then we have paid far less attention to, for example, on use production. No, we have a substantial share of the population who devote, you know, a lot of time just for self-production and self-consumption. So we really don't know uh, how this intersects with different dimensions of inequality. Also, there are new dimensions that are emerging, for example, voluntary work, unpaid, uh, trainee work, also other forms of work that this framework is also trying to capture in the analysis, no? So I think this is also important because really uh, take us to the issue of data, no? What uh, Werner was talking about, no? So what the kind of data we need to not only monitor and measure inequalities 
in labor market outcomes, also in dimensions related to work. No? So, and what um, I've been trying to do over the last weeks is try to a bit to understand, for example, the ILO identified, as Alessandro was mentioning, seven thematic areas you know, uh, <laughs> that are related to the world of work, for example, and these are kind of priority areas that the focus is at the moment on, on this, uh, for example, on employment creation, equal access of quality education and training, adequate protection to workers. And all these seven uh, thematic themes relate to a number of dimensions that are really important and they encapsulate different types of also conditions. Some of them relate to agencies so how norms, for example, can uh, prevent specific groups to enter, for example, the labor market, you know, social norms that can also discriminate specific individuals by identity, you know. So these are issues about agency. There are other things which relate to institutions, you know, so how institutions are built over, over, uh, over time that set the conditions and the, the, the rules of the game to engage in the labor markets. And this is about nationals and supranational institutions, you know? So the ILO plays a very active role in supranational institutions like the ILO conventions and recommendations play a very important role. But you have also important institutions that uh, in a way facilitate um, the transition to a more equal uh, a situation um, when you start to think about what are the things that normally drive inequalities in the world of work. And also structural factors, you know, you have issues that have been discussed, for example, whether an economy has been growing. We know that over the last two centuries, the main factor in driving prosperity in Europe has been a steady growth, you know, 2% on average has facilitated the transition to prosperity in Europe, for example. No? So we have um, grades or, or rates of growth, which are obviously very high in, for example, in certain spells in, in certain countries, but then you see crisis. No? So the volatility of growth really matters. So, so how these structural factors facilitate <clears throat> the transition to a more equal society is also a, a very important. Obviously, in, the informal economies are a very important factor in low and middle income countries. In Africa, the share of the labor force in, in, for, in the informal economy is between 60 to 90 percent, you know, depending on the, on the country. So it's, it's very important. And all these factors are interconnected. You know? So um, the job of this, um, the conceptual framework is trying to understand the linkages between all these dimensions. Um, that, in a way, uh, been guided by the work that the ILO and others have done over the, over the decades. <clears throat> and so how to inform this relies on a number of things that we are doing. So the first one is uh, to understand what we know so far you know, about policies and how are, what are the mechanisms that explain or underpin those kind of relationship in the, in the world of work in the context of inequality. So what we are doing is a, a scoping systematic review that facilitates that process, and I don't want to go in, in, in more in a lot of detail about this, but I think just want, I just want to highlight so how we are doing it. So we are trying to match the seven thematic areas or specific topics that relate to those areas with different manifestations of inequality. And, and this is something that also relates to data at some point, but we are looking at uh, not only, for example, the Gini, you know, or relative notions of inequality. And the reason is because um, uh, the way we measure inequality also in the second phase that I will describe, not just about what we know from the data, information that focuses, for example, on an absolute Gini will give you a very different picture of inequality if you just show the genies, no? So, and that picture will drive conclusions about how you want to address those problems. No, so, so we are also <clears throat> uh, looking at uh, those dimensions in those in those domains, and 
And this is also the link that we are trying to do with the data. So uh, my focus has been so far at the ILO stat database, which is perhaps the main data source for comparative analysis in the ILO. But this is actually just a repository of a lot of data sources that are available uh, around the world. So I think it's one of the richest data sets that I have come across. And also I'm working with the micro data. So it's, it's very rich. You know, the, 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 the sources are multiple, like the household income and experience service, the Liverpool service, uh, administrative data, census data, you know, multiple data sources. And they are different indicators. Sorry, well, I just wanted to show you how it looks, you no? Know? <clears throat> in the micro data set. So there are multiple uh, indicators that can capture different dimensions of inequalities in the world work. And one of the things that, for example, <clears throat> is also interesting is that at the moment we have information of earnings, which is essentially an income. But we really don't know, or we don't have data for comparative analysis about income. We don't know. And which is critical because, for example, if I estimate the Gini coefficient based on earnings, you will get in South Africa Gini coefficient close to 70, I guess. <laughs> <No>? <laughs> Probably. So, so, and so, for example, these are the things that um, are very important in terms of the developing a diagnostic tool. You know, what kind of data uh, can be implemented to facilitate that process in the, in the medium term. So, what we are also doing is to uh, propose a series of indices that can also give you a different picture of inequalities, not just from a relative perspective, that is usually what we normally do, and conventionally is the Gini, no? The Gini is very problematic. Uh, we have been discussing a lot about the importance of looking at subnational so level, no? I think the main issues about inequality nowadays is not just about looking at the Gini in X or Y country, but it's to look at the, the, the complexities and the diversities within those countries. You know? So the Gini cannot be decomposable by population surveys. No? So the Gini is, is, is maybe not the best inequality measure for that purpose. You know? and, but we, we are suggesting a, a composite of indices that allow you to estimate not only one particular approach, but also horizontal inequalities and also different dimensions that you can compare, for example, gaps by different groups. And also one of the things that we want to introduce is the concept of inequality of opportunity. It's not just inequality, but simply because it gives you a very good understanding about the root causes of a specific dimensions of inequality. You know? And the idea is that in the database, they look can have those kind of tools uh, for monitoring and measuring inequalities in the world work. So, and so far, <clears throat> uh, what we have done is to identify certain gaps, you no? Know? And this is where probably the link between what we are doing and the work that AFD and the University of Cape Town has been doing is very important because, for example, there is a, a still substantial informational gaps in the era of work, not necessarily the labor markets, you no. Know? Also, we have, as I said, limited information to estimate uh, disposable income, you know? So, uh, and the reason is because some of these data sources from, come from, for example, the labor force service that they don't have information about redistribution, you know? So we can, this is when, for example, tools that, uh, for example, by using a regression analysis or using some imputational methods, you can estimate the disposable income by knowing the rate of taxation in, in a country. So this can be done, but at the moment we don't have disposable income at the other level, no? And obviously, as I said, at subnational level, there is a substantial informational gaps. Um, I think in, in the majority of the countries, the, 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 uh, the level below the, the country level is level one or level two, I don't remember, which is, province or states, depending on the country. But below that, we don't have representative data, no? And this is when also um, the statistical creativity is required, no? So how to play around sample surveys with probably other additional information that can uh, achieve this particular goal, no? But yes, I just want to finish with that. Thank you very much.
Thank you so, so much. Um, and is there any clarification questions? I don't know. The idea was, oh, there is one. Perfect. <laughs> there are two, even. Oh, there's another mic there. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zenzi. Um, I would just like to find out, uh, Miguel. Yes, hi. Um, your presentation, and that's the reason why I raised my hand so quickly, is because I saw a lot of things that implied unpaid care work, but that word was never used. And you mentioned, um, like you wanted to include things like uh, uh, volunteer work and capturing those kinds of things. Um, but then the thing is volunteer work, it looked like it was activities for use of, uh, sorry, activities for others, right? Or for people uh, uh, doing things for people outside of the family. But are you capturing or are you intending on capturing unpaid care work within the household? Because I think that also, that has a very big effect on equal access to employment, uh, especially for women. And I think it also broadens the scope of, of what we call work. So, I, and also uh, that can be captured from time use surveys. And I also didn't kind of see that in this. So that's just the only comment question. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take Thomas' question and then I'm going to ask you to come here so that the colleagues online could see. Thank you, Anda. Maybe two two questions, in fact. One was on green jobs. Uh, you, you stated earlier, Jens, that uh, there could be as many as 6 million jobs at stake, uh, but also a potential for 24 million jobs being created. And I was wondering whether this is in sort of a partial equilibrium approach or global equilibrium. And, and why do I say that? We, 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 there's been a report in France recently saying that the transition could be inflationary by nature. So there could be job creation typically in the energy production because we have a more labor intensive, uh, tomorrow there would be a labor intensive uh, uh, production of energy, but this may involve more inflation, a higher level of prices or hence a smaller level of consumption in other sectors. So there might be job destroyed in other sectors than just energy or those directly exposed to, to climate change and transition. So uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel about this? Uh, second question is that uh, when we tend to think of jobs, we tend to think about sunset and sunrise industries, so jobs created or destroyed, but not necessarily so on the evolution of skills in other sectors. And uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the typically very important sector, agriculture, so directly impacted by climate change, where you would expect the skills for farmers to, to evolve because they might be confronted to different climate conditions, typically. Uh, and and it's, it's, in, in that case, it's an entirely different set of public policies to accompany uh, farmers because then they need to acquire new skills, uh, not necessarily uh, just to train uh, people uh, uh, skilled in renewables for renewables energy, for example, or, or or, or find new jobs for, for miners, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a really different public policy. So um, in that case, I'm wondering exactly how you would um, estimate or what's your take on the jobs that, need, that will need to evolve and not necessarily only do so directly at stake. Thank you. Given that we have got straight to the difficult questions, I'm just going to ask a colleague from uh, from Stade to Werner and and Murray, if you guys have any reactions, and this way we can ask the ILO and friends colleagues to to respond. But you need to come here because if not, the colleagues who are online are just seeing this thing. So. I do agree that hybrid is not ideal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's 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 a debate. Yeah, the the hybrid versus in person debate is uh, one in the age of budget cuts and government and cost containment. Everything is go virtual, but the what you lose on the the back end is crazy. No, I I think the the, the two presentations were very very interesting, um, especially with when Miguel's one at the end where he sort of broke it down. The different types of inequality but an opportunity horizontal inequalities and things like that and what is what excites me is that the, the indicators teal palma all the things that were brought out was sort of exactly what we did with the inequality trends report which were indicators that were not in the discussion were not main uh mainstreamed right you had the the, the basic concept of the the the, the genie and that's how everyone sort of began and thought of of inequality but when, with what we did with the diagnostic was exactly trying to branch out and bring those variables into the mainstream and to say look at it holistically 
um, how they intersect with one another that they can tell the story. So I, you know, it was exciting to see the the range of indicators there, and I think there were some that we hadn't explored yet. That I, you know, immediately my first thought was, can we? How can we incorporate more of those ones into the the next one? And I think that's, uh, you know, linking back to the question earlier, so for the impact on the policymakers is that they now talk in these these um the wider indicator uh discourse right that they understand that there is um you cannot just look at one thing in isolation to to tell the the, the full story it has to be a more um holistic approach and i think it's nice to see i think my only um sort of question you spoke about um i think alessandro spoke about pilot programs that they are running with countries and i guess from from my, I'd just be curious to hear a bit more about you know what does that entail and where have you have has it happened? Uh, I think that would be mine. But I think it's thank you. I think immediately there's takeaways that I can bring into the next inequality trends report. Thank you, Mo. Perfect. Go ahead. You want to give it Yeah, I'll just make a few quick comments because I don't think I deserve any special privilege uh, beyond the rest of you guys who are dying to make your points. Um, and uh, I just wanted to 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 to, to strongly uh, support a point that Alessandro was making about about the fact that a, a focus on labour market inequality is an incredibly useful uh, focus in terms of. You, you know, you made the point by, by saying, okay, but that, you know, equalities of opportunity or pre-market things all come back in a sort of a long, in a dynamic sense of a sustainable society or, or even a metric of, okay, where is the society actually going? It comes through the labor market. And um, so just to endorse your point, you, you know, uh, co completely and uh, and that hell of a complicated uh, diagram that Miguel had up made the point as well in its in its own way. Uh, so so you, you know one one does have that that's a very strong endorsement. If you're going to do something in the sort of specialist area that dives in more detail beyond the inequality trends overview, uh, it it's a great place to focus because it then does pull all the other elements in. Um, and uh, and including, I, I think it is a plausible case that it's incre it's at, actually at the heart of the just transition discussion as well. So even in terms of the focus of this particular um, meeting, it it it's got a a, a lot to um, to add. And of course, Jens said a lot of things earlier on. Everybody's endorsed that point in a sense. It all passes through the and and your net jobs versus. Um, you know, job loss, job gains, uh, uh, in a country-specific context, global aggregates are fine and interesting. But that's the, at the very heart. If you listen to like Nick Stern talking about the just transition, he says this is a unique opportunity for us all to push beyond. We even before COVID, we knew that that the inclusive growth thing was running out of steam and wasn't working very well. We knew that. But we, we didn't seem to have the capacity. We almost need like, as with many inequality things, you need a, like a shock, a disaster almost. Um, and so, but how are we going to do that? How are we going to prepare ourselves? How are we going to give the, uh, you, know, you know, to turn the narrative just from, okay, what are we going to do about these guys that are going to lose their job? To anchor this thing in a, a, a constructive, inclusive uh, uh, sustainable uh, growth perspective um so uh it's it's very promising that that's that's uh uh all i want to comment on uh, about what miguel was saying was uh it completely endorse it's a complicated diagram and the and the difficulty is there's an honesty to the diagram and there's an honesty to the framework that's like the question that was made about home production. And th this is the hard end of 
of inequality, but it's also the hard end of the ability to actually respond and be resilient and adaptive. And how does a society actually work? And wealth, wealth inequality, for example, is not just a voyeuristic thing. Okay, let's get all upset about this thing. It's consequential to what people have got to work with in response. Um, uh, but of course, as you said, the African labor market, it, it raises many issues about what we're not measuring right now. Uh, the informality issue and, and bringing it in well, the home uh, production issue and bringing it. So they data challenges. And my experience of the current African discourse, by the way, is the fact that we can't measure these things gives very easy recourse back to the comfort zones of where the growth discussion is right now, the inclusive growth discussion. So everybody says, oh, we had premature deindustrialization, blah, blah, blah. We need to regenerate manufacturing. Well, you know, that's just going all the way back to, you don't have the broader profiling in, you know, in which you frame that. So I think that on the one hand, you're completely right, but it's quite daunting for, for a policy world that wants stuff. Now, it's, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of sophistication to the green jobs area that was alluded to area earlier, and we'll talk about it in the, in the conference as a whole, that the hard end and the difficult end of that is the informal uh, jobs and making sure that they're included in the discussion, even in the net, net gains and, and losses. Uh, one, one other point, I think that the mobility perspective, it's fine to do all these uh, generalized entropy measures and things, we do them. That's that's what I do for a living. Um, uh, it, it doesn't really resonate in the policy uh, discussions, you know, uh, um, so, uh, but, but you had you had me. So, in the South African case and in the diagnostic case, the Palmer ratio did it, even though it doesn't pass the axioms of good inequality measures and stuff like that, because it just brought. If you contrast a Gini and a Palmer, but anyway, my point was about also that a social mobility perspective. You you mentioned edu if one can do like a measure of a texture of a society is let's look at intergenerational education mobility. Let's look at intergenerational earnings mobility. They often don't look the same. Um, and uh, and and it's very telling and it resonates with people a lot because this is their society. And they, if people are talking nonsense on the, on the talk shows, they get on the blower and say, no, no, but in my family, it's exactly like that, right? M my kids are going nowhere slowly, you know? Um, and... Um, uh, uh, but yeah, okay, so final point then about the, it, it, given what I was saying earlier about the, you know, the movement into the policy space and people want to do benefit incidence analysis and things, again, the labor market is, is very badly handled by those policy tools. So you're pushing into a space that's currently not at all well handled in the broader policy discussion about labor markets and social protection and how that all integrates. It's you're filling a gap. Yes. Thank you, sir. I'll just give the floor to colleagues. I wanted to flag to Miguel, with respect to your comment on um, the disposable income, that at IV, we have done a lot of work with uh, the colleagues uh, in Luxembourg at the Luxembourg Income Study Center, specifically to try to create that variable for disposable income in countries where there is the income variable in the data. So we're trying to push in that direction. But I know who wants to start from the ILO and friends. Jack? Because, so thank you very much. That's not an easy question, huh? I think. So So I think if I understand your question, what, you know, those skills for green jobs, or green jobs have been created, it might actually, you know, not be also rosy because there might be other types of inflationary pressures that actually doesn't create those jobs, right? Um, and then the second question, you know, what happens in these other sectors? You know, the spillover effects into other sectors. And I think this is what everyone's grappling with. Huh? I mean, e economists develop their theories and always assuming, assuming X, then Y will happen, right? And I think we simply don't know. Huh? Um, uh, we don't know yet, but just to say from the ILO side, what we are pleading for is um, policy coherence. So if you look at the ILO Justin Session guidelines, it's not it's not just these guidelines came out in 2015, was developed by a 
tripartite group of experts, in, including from South Africa, from organized business, labor, and government. Uh, and now they were endorsed by the International Labor Conference now in 2023, which is the supreme decision-making body of the ILO. They are all 187 member states, government, employers, and workers. And this, uh, these nine policy areas looks at, and this is perhaps where you see silo mentality across many government departments and sectors, where you look at education in, in separate from industry and growth policies and so on and so forth. And what these nine policy areas are looking at is macroeconomic and growth oriented policies, industrial and sexual policies, enterprise policies, skills policies, so that when new opportunities and new investments are happening in certain, certain sectors, there can also be movement between sectors. So coming to, to the jobs. So how is skills development and access to, to skills and lifelong learning, I think is the word we're using now because it is a continuous learning process. Uh, how can you move within sectors and be upskilled if you need a new type of job, but also how can you move between sectors? So for instance, how can workers in, in coal production or in the uh, coal mines in Pumalanka move into renewable energy, which might not happen in the same place, but in a totally different uh, place like in Northern province in South Africa. And I think these are the, these are the transition complexities that I think there is no easy answer to. But um, um, and but most important, I think, from the island side, and something that hasn't really come up is the access to social protection. Mm -hmm. So social protection in terms of unemployment insurance, occupational health insurance. So when you fall out of employment, if you are employed, and you go into, you be, let's say you're being shipped, your job is being shipped by one of the big coal mining producers in Pumalanka, where do you go? Do you have access to unemployment insurance benefits, social protection benefits? And I think this is where you look at the majority of workers in the world, you know, close to 87% does not have any form of social protection. And I think this is the challenge that large um, informal economy, because we're not talking about labor markets in the traditional sense where it's labor, but I think that distinction make well made between what is employment and what is work. So labor uh, assumes you are in an employment relationship between an employer and an employee, but much of the work in the world of work today is not in that relation. People own account workers, they work for own benefit and so, so forth. How do, they, how do they actually have access to these opportunities? But I think, um, yeah, the jury is still out. Just one thing, uh, final, final comment. Um, how do we define green jobs? And so one thing is what we say green jobs that are, uh, let's say, typically green, production of renewable energy, working environments, the service sectors. But then, so that's what we say green, but then there's that whole aspect of greening. So let's say a um, textile company is using renewable energy to power their machines and their workplace. I mean, that is a type of greening of an enterprise and those jobs in that enterprise are then by definition also becoming greener. So it's a sliding scale huh? and it's a, you know, not 50 shades of gray, but the 50 shades of uh, green and perhaps even more okay. as, as, as this is developing. Huh? Thanks. I don't know if Alexander does. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to try to answer some of these difficult questions, and I'm probably going to be very political about it, which means I'm not going to answer them. Um, uh, no, jokes aside, I'm going to... Uh, so some of these uh, obviously relate to some areas that other colleagues in other departments are working on, but I uh, hopefully I can provide part of the answer, and maybe then Miguel can, can fetch upon a little more on the on the, on the the care war aspect. Um, now, um, first off, on um, on the skills, um, skills aspect, one thing that I wanted to mention is that um we we the reason why in in the strategy it talks about lifelong learning is because we're not talking just about skills but also about upskilling and reskilling so obviously depending on the context on the sector the policy recommendation is different and then um the type of work that we would do to support constituents to address the challenges uh linked to that case inequality but also to climate change is something that you know we, we, th we think about um on on care work um uh, Miguel will definitely talk more about how the conceptual work of uh, framework will integrate that. What I can tell you is that on one hand, the, um, the ILC next year uh, will have a general discussion on decent work and uh, care work. So 
um, and that's element number one. And second, the 19th International Conference of Labor Statisticians just took place, and there was a specific resolution um, concerning work, employment, and labor and, and utilization, which talks about unpaid, um, unpaid, uh, unpaid care work. So the conceptual framework will be aligned with how um, the ICLS talks about and um, plans it. I can't go into too much detail because I'm not too familiar and this just ended last week, uh, but maybe bilaterally we can also talk and we can, we can, I can point you in some directions in terms of documents and so on. Um, on uh, the pilot countries uh, where we're working in, um, so basically um, the strategy calls for the development of country-specific approaches. And after the strategy was endorsed, um, some countries volunteered to pilot the development of these country-specific approaches to prevent and reduce inequalities in the world of work, which is a mouthful, um, and others were identified in collaboration with the, re with the regional offices. Um, we're looking for a total of five at this stage, and we found three. One of them is Namibia, which is also a pathfinder country for uh, the Global Accelerator, um, uh, the Global Accelerator, um, which um, was quite adamant to be one of the pilot countries. And I think uh, that their political will to tackle inequality is something that they have been vocal about, including at the HLPF uh, this year, for example, at the SDG summit. They, they, I think they either signed or supported the call for action launched by um, BFI to save SDG 10. Um, so it, it's great to be to be to be working in Namibia because they're quite committed. Um, the second one that we're working in in is Iraq, which is a definitely a peculiar context, but again, it's one where there's a strong political will. And the third one that we're working in right now is uh, is Chile, um, where uh, things are slowly starting we're trying to figure out exactly what we're gonna do but in all three uh, one we're applying the 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 strategy so the guiding principles the seven thematic area we're starting with first a quote-unquote diagnostic in the sense that we're we're trying to see what data is there can we put together a report so that we can identify the priorities from a contextual perspective then we need to look at the political priorities so what policies are already in place which ones have to be developed um, and what are the capacities? What does uh, what do the constituents need to uh, to take this forward and ensure sustainability and ownership? Um, do we still have time for Miguel's input, or we're we done? Yeah, Miguel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, well, I, I was I will start by addressing first of all uh, you, the comment on. On care work, and I think this is a very important one. So I think the ILO, because some of the the ideas and the conceptual framework that I presented rely on the work that they have done in the past. So, and it's not just the ILO. To be fair, has been uh, a lot of people working on precisely incorporating dimensions of work. You no, know? so and uh, yes, uh, the 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 notion of work in, considers work for own use and also for the use by others. And this is where care takes place. No? And, and I think it's very important because if you think about several contexts, um, in fact, not looking at these dimensions can be uh, very um, detrimental for understanding the, the root causes of inequality. Um, for example, uh, um, we know that, for example, uh, maternity leave laws are limited in, and um, I would say, sixty percent of the countries have maternity leaves that last for ninety days. No, so women usually choose to leave the labor market to look after the kids, and that creates these structural problems. You no, know? so certainly it's, it's a very important point, and we will uh, try to make the linkage in the conceptual framework. Yes. So, and, and thank you, Mary, for, for your comments. I think that, yes, I mean, I am uh, particularly uh, aware uh, of the complexities and also because there are so many issues, the, the thematic areas that the ILO has underscored. Um, they are relevant, but they are, for example, the linkages between them and also the linkages between those thematic areas and inequalities in the world of work are not very clear cut. No, conceptually and empirically, we don't really know much about, for example, 
the effect of international trade on inequality. It's a massive debate in modern trade economies about this, you know, and the evidence is not clear cut. So, and also we have very limited information about the effect of, for example, global initiatives like foreign aid on inequality. So we've been doing some work with the European Commission and AFD on this respect. So these are elements that we need to understand better, but certainly um, it gives a, a, an additional layer of complexity to this conceptual framework and also makes them also, the question is how to bring all those complexities in a way that can be maybe more policy informative, because I, I, I get your point, no? Um, and also, obviously, the there is the the data on lease. Yes, uh, uh, we uh, we are aware of the, the information that is in, in at the lease and also at different repositories. The issue is that, of course, the idea is that trying to help the ILO to develop uh, a set of informational tools that can help countries and agencies to track inequalities and. And I think the issue certainly is about uh, the work that needs to be done, but also um, some some countries simply don't have information to estimate disposable income. So, uh, and we need to uh, think about how how to do it. You know? um, but yeah, so well, that I I hope I covered most of the points. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so just, I would like to do you know, maybe five minutes. Do you want to maybe say any concluding remarks for Acer? And, and I don't have the colleague that uh, I mean, I would like also to react because one of the, well, we did mention that we are conducting inequality diagnostics elsewhere uh, outside Africa. And we have completed uh, one, well, in Colombia that was launched at the last, at, uh, like last year. We will be launching the one in Indonesia on the 14th of November, so that's next week. Um, and we're very much looking forward to that one. I don't know if you want to say anything about that inequality diagnostic. And uh, and we're also, uh, we have a partial one in Mozambique and one in Mali. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you, Anda. Uh, actually, I already pre prepared some PowerPoint, but uh, maybe I will just uh, tell you briefly about this report. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Utomo, a research representative from University of Indonesia. It's, uh, uh, we call it LPM, Economic, Economic Institute Research from University of Indonesia. So we are currently partnering with AFD uh, to conduct an uh, inequality diagnostic report. So, uh, yeah, we will disseminate it, disseminate it in 14 November in Indonesia. So it's next week. And uh, maybe before I uh, explain to you about uh, inequality topic, uh, maybe uh, uh, I will just tell you about the overview of, uh, about the Indonesia because uh, I know that Indonesia may be not familiar to all. Uh, some of you, or maybe all of you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Indonesia is located in Southeast Asia and uh, is a developing nation with an uh, impressive population of over uh, 270 million people in there. So, it's the uh, fourth largest, uh, most populous in the world. And uh, what makes Indonesia unique is its uh, extensive archipelago. So, uh, it's compressing with five primary islands and 16,000 smaller uh, smaller islands. So uh, maybe you know Bali, uh, as, uh, yeah, you all know of, of its natural beauty and cultural business. It's just one of the uh, islands in Indonesia. So uh, its geographical features is uh, have distinguished Indonesia from uh, other large developing countries like China, India, and Brazil. Uh, which are primarily uh, characterized by large continents. Uh, so maybe uh, I will just tell you about that this study is led by Mohamed Hanri, but unfortunately he is uh, still uh, has another conference in Tokyo and 
uh, he will come in this conference uh, tomorrow morning. So it's uh, about it's inequality. Uh, the study goal is to give a full picture of how, how inequality looks in Indonesia. So we are not looking just uh, about economic aspect, but also in like uh, other multidimensional inequality, such as labor market, physical assets, social aspect, like education and health, and also physical infrastructure like connectivity, access to water clean, uh, sanitation and electricity. And for the uh, data, uh, uh, we are currently partnering, uh, also partnering with uh, Central Bureau of Statistics in Indonesia. So we, uh, so we can get uh, more trusted and reliable data. And this data is spanning from 20 and 12 until uh, 2021. Uh, so it's spanning uh, three years. And maybe in general, the findings uh, show that uh, inequality in Indonesia has decreased over the past 10 years. Uh, this improvement is consistent through various measurements in inequality like Gini, Palma, and others. Uh, the main reason for this decrease is that people with higher incomes have seen their earnings drop. And uh, while this situation for the bottom 40% has not changed much. So this highlights the need for better social protection and assistance program for the poor people. And additionally, uh, there is a significant difference between Java and the rest of Indonesia. Uh, so we often uh, had an analysis geographical to differentiate between Java and outside of Java or non-Java. And uh, and because uh, Java has a huge population, it uh, has more than 50% of the total population lives there. And there's a, play, a major role in the Indonesian economy. So when we look uh, at how inequality, yeah, uh, we see about Java and non-Java. Uh, in terms of physical assets, uh, asset ownership uh, increase over time and uh, inequality of physical asset is decreased. Uh, actually, this physical asset consists of uh, nine uh, ownership of assets like cars, motorcycles, and uh, other assets that include in the questionnaires. So uh, for the labor inequality, uh, we are highlighted that uh, there is an increase in informal sector in urban areas and a high unemployment rate among vocational graduates. So, uh, and other about labor inequality is women have a low participation rate and more vulnerable due to concentration in informal sectors. And maybe the last is a basic service like internet, clean water and sanitation and electricity uh, are less accessible to people with lower incomes. Also, there is a special electricity subsidy for the poor. Uh, maybe uh, that's all for me. Uh, I'm heading back to and there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think we will we will stop here. I think on our side, one thing we wanted also to flag is that we will also be launching a research project with the colleagues at uh, UCT, but also at the HSRC, the Human Science Research Council, looking specifically, and again, this is something that you guys had mentioned, Adela, um, the impact of the transition on jobs, trying to identify green, neutral, and productive jobs, and using the tax data in order to localize exactly where those jobs are. So this is something we're just starting uh, in the next couple of weeks after the concert, after we're done with this. Um, and we would be delighted to collaborate with, with uh, whoever wants to around this. So a big thank you again to everyone and to participate. Oh, please, yes. Can I ask a quick question to Bernard? Oh, yes. So just a quick question on, on the quarterly labor force survey. And I'm asking, it's a sneaky question because it's something we've tried before, it didn't work out. How about introducing a green jobs module in the quarterly labor force survey in South Africa? So we over time can track the amount of green jobs that are being produced, both in terms of in green sectors, but also greening the sectors. We're working with... ERF and introducing that in the Egyptian lab, uh, labor market panel survey. 
for instance. So we could also collaborate on that. It would be interesting on adding specifically a green jobs module on, on that. So it could be interesting to, to make the links. So um, we have a, a, another side event starting at 12 from the colleagues from the local south. Two other uh, side events this afternoon. Uh, one, half past one, the EU will be talking specifically about their approach uh, using an inequality marker. So again, this links to what Miguel had mentioned around the impact of aid actually on inequality. So that is one of the first tools that would allow us to, to get there. Uh, and then a uh, side event from the college at the African Climate and Development Initiatives around climate inclusive climate action. So thank you again and see you a bit later then.